make as much money from a stable existing system. They don't make money from maintaining and operating a system. They make money when there's an opportunity to change or disrupt the system. And sometimes that's entirely additive. And once enough capital and technology companies decided they could make a ton of money in an energy transition, the only thing sort of between them and success in that market opportunity was kind of the fossil fuel industry and incumbent that was easy to demonize. And largely working families who were gonna bear the brunt of a poorly planned and executed energy transition. In the late 80s, to kick off deregulation across different segments of the economy, the natural gas clearinghouse company and the predecessors to Enron began to trade natural gas in a standardized manner. And so they could develop contracts that could be traded financially, very similar to what we do with, with corn, wheat, any of the agricultural commodities. We were like, well, we made a market in oil and gas. We could probably do that in electricity. And they start looking into that. And it turns out they have some ready allies who were successful in deregulating trucking and airlines. And they were like, well, what about electricity? A very successful entry into the natural gas industry created a mantra. And the mantra inside Enron was that everything will be like natural gas. California was the, the kickoff, if you will, for the, the deregulation effort. Well, good morning and welcome. Reagan was in office. The, the goal of free market capitalism was, was out in front. The goal was and remains increased energy independence for America. Through constant over-regulation of energy producers and industries in the past, the Department of Energy shackled our drive to increase domestic production. And so the California legislature became the target, if you will, primarily the executives at Enron and a bunch of consultants who went out and said, look, you've overbuilt your physical plant and you don't have to pay to have that generator sitting idle for eight months out of the year. Why don't we set it up so that the generator only gets paid when it's actually turning electricity into the grid? This way we will minimize 
the wholesale price, you'll be giving your constituents, the voters, your base, a tax cut. That was the, the optimization discussion that many folks had, had bought into, uh, which led to, first of all, California breaking apart its vertically integrated utilities, and that was followed closely by Texas. The success in the deregulated natural gas market convinced the management that Enron can be very successful in any market that deregulates. If all this sounds incredibly complicated, that's because it is. Enron made a living trading things most people don't understand. Deregulation wasn't adopted with a consumer in mind. It was pitched as a free market effort. But the market was set up by the very folks who stood to profit. The energy traders turned big chunks of America's electric grid into a private casino, and the house always won. And of this day, and of this day, so help me God, so help me God. The MBAs and traders turned their guns towards Texas. They found a very, very willing governor in George W. Bush who would entertain this idea of deregulating the market. In other words, making the generators themselves compete on a day-to-day -day basis as to whether or not they were going to produce electricity into the grid. I want to compliment Senator, compliment Senator Sibley of the Senate and, how, and member uh, Steve Wollins of the House, one Republican and one Democrat, for enacting some of the most far-reaching electric deregulation of any state in this United States. This is a session that we all can be proud of, both Republican and Democrat. The results will make Texas a better place for years to come. The Enron strategy was not just uh, taking advantage of deregulation, Enron became a promoter of deregulation, using uh, lobbyists in Washington and using political connections to accelerate the rate of deregulation of many different industries. Enron provides a lot of the campaign donations and a lot of the heavy weight to get the spot market created. The incentives are not for a stable grid. In the regional transmission operator areas of the grid, there's an auction. There's a clearing price on the auction. The auctions actually reward when the grid is shaky and expensive. Sold them 700. I think that what happened in California was the case of manipulation of the market by withholding generation from the market. Enron was fairly famous for taking plants offline during the California crisis because then other plants were higher paid and Enron got the clearing price on whatever plants they had online. You know, you say, well, something is knocking in my turbine, I better take the baby offline. And by restricting supply, you drive the prices. So Enron was making a bunch of money just by taking plants offline. Like I say, look at the incentives and I'll tell you the results. Did Enron take advantage of California in the year 2000? Absolutely. Did it manipulate markets? Of course it did. But the underlying problem was we just didn't have enough electricity supply. We just hadn't built enough natural gas power plants. And the reason we hadn't built enough natural gas power plants is because the People in charge in California, they believed that they didn't need as much reliable energy. They could just reduce demand using energy efficiency and meet demand using solar panels and wind turbines. Jeff Skilling of Enron, at one point, when they go to take on the California utilities, he says, we are on the side of the angels, right? So there's this weird confluence of free marketeers, former oil and gas guys, and the Greens, who were all pitted against things like big power plants. And I would say they created the paradigm through which we see energy now, which is just-in-time natural gas backing up a whole buttload of renewables. That's the Enron dream. I mean, there are still turbines with the Enron logo on it out there in North Texas somewhere, spinning to this day. Obviously, I'm disappointed, but, um... Yeah, so that's the way the system works. Thank you, folks. Enron laid the foundation for a deregulated market. 
It undermined the stability of the electric grid and placed a premium on volatility over reliability. The ultimate irony? Texas politicians copied California's energy policies. There was money to be made after all. Consumers be damned. Last year, heat waves in California sparked massive power outages that impacted nearly 50% of the state's counties. And many Texas Republicans, they couldn't help but doing a dance of schadenfreude. Ted Cruz, a Texas senator, uh, repeatedly has mocked power outages in California, now being criticized as Texas grapples with winter storms that have caused many to lose power. In California, we've pursued this less is more, small is beautiful vision to the point where we don't have enough electricity to serve our needs. As the heat pushes the Golden State's power grid to the brink of blackouts, residents urge to conserve energy during peak evening hours. Keep doing what you've done, one or two more nights of this, and we will turn the page. I know less about Texas. Listen, we know that you folks at home have faced struggles by going without power. This is a business decision. Investors are embracing alternative energy precisely because it's the lower cost fuel. My impression of Texas, you found a way to pay less with a higher level of risk and you got whacked. The Texas-California blackout, those circumstances arose for diametrically opposed reasons that are consistent with the character of each state. Now here in Texas, we have the nation's largest wind-powered fleet. 30,000 plus megawatts. We have a solar plant that is going to be well in excess of 5,000 megawatts at some point this summer. And because these plants have federal tax credits and production tax credits, at various points, these plant owners are actually bidding into the grid at a negative price. One of the strange byproducts of the federal subsidies for wind and solar, negative prices. It's one of the many peculiarities of a system that was designed by lawyers instead of engineers. More than any other state in America, California has been at the forefront of the renewable energy push. The result has been less reliability and affordability. And who gets hurt the most when prices go up and reliability goes down? The poor and the middle class. California doesn't welcome Latino families and other low to moderate income families because it's just so expensive to live here. A lot of people are worse off today than 20 years ago. My name is Robert Abadaka, and I'm the co-founder of The 200. 200 is a project of California community builders with the idea of building affordable housing. And in the process, we decided that we wanted to build affordably priced housing but it was home ownership. And we did that in a community known as Fireball, California in Fresno County. And then after that, we started pulling together different people from around the state that were also concerned about the home ownership issue. I had worked with members of the 200 to eliminate other barriers established by the environmental community uh, that were causing a disparate and harmful impact in minority communities. So we had worked together in solving that problem. And then the California Air Resources Board wanted to require housing to be net zero greenhouse gas. But what they meant was net zero also for people who had to drive to or from the house for the life of the house. That was the CARB model for reducing greenhouse gas. They also didn't want people to drive. When we were fighting smog, no one said, ah, we need to just stop working. If we stop working, we won't need to drive. And if we don't drive, we won't have smog. So CARB, more or less out of the blue, punished those who have to drive. Who's driving the farthest? The people who are priced out of neighborhoods closer to their work. What color are those people? What income levels do those people have? You know, I think home ownership is really the cornerstone of our middle class, and it's an incredible story. No other civilization in the world has achieved a democracy with this much ownership participation as the homeowner has in America. 
And so it's a very, very, very important value that's part of the California dream as well as the American dream. And it's been absolutely assaulted by California housing and uh, environmental policies, and now exacerbated further by energy policies. Mary Nichols, the former chair of CARB, has long identified as a progressive liberal Democrat from the West part of LA, completely aligned politically in her own mind with oppressed communities of color. And we sat down with her, with this incredible group of civil rights leaders. And instead of even giving them the courtesy around a table of a dozen people, of letting them introduce themselves, she launches into how could we possibly question CARB's commitment to the environment or commitment to climate change leadership? How misguided are we? Mary could not be on the wrong side of civil rights leaders. It was not part of her DNA. And she said, but we're really, we're, we're, we're trying to help you. We're gonna spend some of our cap and trade dollars, which is some money that CARB creates from effectively taxing petroleum. We're gonna spend some of that on affordable housing in your communities. And John Gamboa said, Mary, affordable housing in California is code for rents. We spent our whole careers trying to get out of the projects and you're trying to put us back in? And she got silent. And she said, okay, I get it, I'll fix it. And ever since then, they have refused to even talk with us. It's an incredible level of arrogance and immunity from any kind of public accountability. Folks talk about, hey, we care about the poor, the downtrodden, where your policies that you're enacting really impact those people the most that can least afford it. First of all, let me say climate change is real, but in California right now, people are thinking about paying their mortgage and rent putting food on the table, putting gas in the car, surviving. I mean, you'd be surprised how many folks are just trying to lower their bills. They don't use their air conditioner, they don't use their heater. You don't deal with them, you don't see them, you don't go to their houses. I've been in their houses as a law enforcement officer. I'm in someone's house and it's 90 degrees, I'm sweating. And they're sitting there because they can't use their electricity. They can't use it to cool their house off because they're barely surviving. In an effort to end poverty or end inequality, we've actually increased poverty and increased inequality by making electricity and housing and food so expensive. Over the last 10 years, electricity prices should have gone down. And the main reason they didn't is because we've added so much weather-dependent renewables, which drive up the cost of electricity simply because they require so much more people and equipment to manage all of that unreliability. Since 2008, when then-Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed an executive order mandating utilities get at least a third of the juice they sell from renewables, the cost of electricity in California has increased three times faster than the rest of the U.S. And remember, these rate increases are happening in California, which has the highest poverty rate in America. California will require all new homes to have solar power beginning in 2020. State regulators announced- The state just passed a law, I believe a year or two ago, all new residential housing must have solar on it. So up until now, solar was for the rich, basically. If you're a have, you can have that solar panel on your house and pay less. And if you're have not, you don't get that. You, can't, you don't benefit from that. And most folks in California don't own their own residences. They don't own their houses. So don't get the rebate on the solar. The state has mandated this policy called net energy metering. Net energy metering helps rich people with solar arrays by not requiring them to have a battery because people are allowed to use the grid for the battery. So as their solar panels produce power during the day when the sun is up, they're able to sell the excess power that they produce into the grid exactly when the grid doesn't need it. The grid is then inundated with solar power and can't use it all. Nonetheless, they get paid a very high price for that power. And then when the grid actually does need the power and they aren't producing solar and nobody is producing solar, then they get to buy their power back at a reduced rate. All of this makes having solar on your roof very attractive financially 
but it also means that the people who can't afford to have solar on their home, it means those people are paying for the rich people to have a highly subsidized solar system. They're just layering these solar panels on top of an existing electrical system that we all pay for, but they're privatizing the benefit and socializing the costs. It's a matter of fairness. So think about this. A single mother with children was subsidizing someone to have solar on their house. Most folks don't have solar, so it's one of those the haves and have-nots. And I just get tired of people talking about that they are for the poor, and they're really passing these regressive taxes and policies that impact the poor the most. We now have an unstable grid. And instead of a true New Deal, FDR, let's make electricity reliable and affordable, there will be entire neighborhoods that have gone dark because they're multifamily working people who don't have access to energy because we've abandoned, actually abandoned the commitment to provide cost-effective and reliable energy to Californians in the name of climate. And now we're setting it up so that only the wealthy have electricity. Please, I have more in common with friends in India who were saying, you have to give us the right to have reliable electricity. You can't, in the name of climate, take away electricity. Same is true in Africa. Well, the same is true in California.